Uh, and I don't mean anything derogatory by that, but you know, you give us so much, and all these lovely desserts and everything, I've got to be careful. And so have you, brother. You're telling me the calories don't happen today, but they do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but thank you ever so much indeed. And uh, we're going to have a, a diversion this afternoon from our series in Daniel in terms of the fact that we're going to go on a little tour of Rome. And uh, some of you, as indicated this morning, uh, have been there, so you will recognise some of the places. And uh, even if you haven't been, you may recognise some of the places you've seen in photographs as well. Um, so we're going to take that course, and uh, I think as we do, you will see that the um, uh, things we've been talking about, such as this morning, will find, uh, be illuminated, as it were, explained by what you see. Okay? Yes, I think they need the lights on for the camera to work, brother. Uh, I made that mistake the other week, and I didn't realise. <laughs> I appreciate we're going to have it both ways. We want the lights out so you can see better on the screen. But if the lights are on, the camera works better. So uh, I'll leave them to sort that out. Anyway, before we do, let's just, by way, uh, remind ourselves of something we looked at, because it's, it's pertinent that we do, something we looked at on the very first presentation I gave you uh, in this series, which you will remember was an introduction to the books of Daniel and Revelation. Do you remember that? Uh, and uh, in that presentation, we concentrated on this verse, for one, where the Apostle Peter tells us that we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. Well, I think we can say today uh, that the prophetic message is truly confirmed before us in many different things. And in fact, some of the things we've been looking at in the book of Daniel helps to confirm the prophetic message also, doesn't it? But we have it more fully confirmed. And then he admonishes us, he says, you will do well to be attentive to this. So we need to be attentive to what God's word says. For what reason? Uh, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now that lamp is likened to God's word as well, isn't it? Because, as the psalmist said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. And you remember the illustration we saw of the man walking in the jungle there? Without that lamp, he wouldn't have known which was the right path to take. He could have wandered off the path. He could have wandered down the wrong path. He could have trod on some dangerous things like that deadly snake. But the lamp shows him not only the way to go, but also reveals the hidden dangers along the way. And uh, from the prophecies we've been looking at in Daniel, I think we can honestly say that the lamp of God's word is not just directing us in the way we should go, it's also exposing some of the hidden dangers that have been placed along the, the Christian highway, uh, so to speak, in our, in our life here on, on this earth. And so we need to take heed to the word of God that we know is trustworthy, it's fully confirmed, and uh, we need to be attentive to what it's saying here because it's there to direct us. It's God's word to us. And if we're not prepared to listen to what God says, we are insulting God. I take it as an insult to God. It, when, it, you know, if, if my children were present, they say, oh, I love you, Daddy, and I love you, Mommy, and so on, they don't call us mummy and daddy now, they call us mum and dad because they're bigger, but, you know, and we were talking to them and they're just ignoring us. That would be very offensive, wouldn't it? And it would be hurtful if your children didn't, didn't uh, uh, take notice of you. Well, think of it that way. God loves us so much and he's given us so much warning and so many things that we need to take heed to. If we ignore him, we don't want to bother listening to what he says to us, then that is insulting to God. And we're really doing it to our own hurt. Uh, we need to take heed because God has given his word to warn us and to guide us for very real and important reasons, as we have been discovering. Again, we made these points in that initial presentation 
that we need to remember that God foresees what will happen in the future and he discloses this to us, that's part of prophecy, and God reveals his plans and purposes by telling us before they take place. So these are good reasons why we need to take heed to God's word. And therefore, when we approach his word, we should come with a prayer in our hearts, seeking for a true understanding of the message of God. You know, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. Not some of it, but all of it. So we should be willing, when we approach the word of God, to seek to understand all that he is seeking to reveal to us. And we should believe his message to us. You know, there's some people, they accept the message in terms of, yes, I acknowledge that's what it says, <clears throat> but do their lives conform to it? Does your life conform to it? Does my life conform to it? Our lives need to be in harmony with what God is saying to us. Coming back to that illustration about the child, if the child says, yes, love you, mommy, love you, daddy, and uh, they listen to what mommy and daddy say, and then they ignore what they say and do their own thing, that is being defiant, isn't it? It's what we're saying, being naughty. Well, God says it's being sinful, being defiant toward him. So we need to believe what he says, and, and then we need to take heed to that message seriously enough to do what God tells us to do. Jesus said to his people, it's recorded there in Luke, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I command you to do? And it's very true in the world today. There's so many, Lord, we do this in your name and do that in your name, and he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. We need to believe his word, and we need to be willing to take it to heart seriously enough in order to follow what God tells us to do. And so, therefore, it comes with this warning that we need to be careful not to rebel against what he reveals to us because he gives it to us for our benefit to know what's going to happen so that we can be safeguarded from the deceptions that the enemy brings upon us and our faith can be encouraged and strengthened along life's way. All right. So we've looked at the prophecies that have been fulfilled so far, the whole of Daniel 2, apart from the final part, which is what? The kingdom of stone that is yet to strike the image of the feet. And we've seen the whole of the four beasts of Daniel 7. Uh, and we've seen uh, what God is telling is going to happen in the future, the little horn that we uh, have identified and we were focusing in on this morning in terms of its defiling God's sanctuary, seeking to substitute or to replace an alternative teaching, an alternative method of the plan of salvation. That is an anti-Christ, in place of Christ situation. And an alternative method, an alternative teaching to what God tells us is a false teaching. And many people have fallen for that because they've been drawn and bred into uh, these ways, you know, I used to, uh, I, I wasn't always an Adventist. Uh, I used to go to the Anglican church and my mother used to take me and, you know, when she found out that Jesus was coming again, that was a message we'd never heard of. And it thrilled our hearts and minds, you know, and we were learning the word of God. Uh, but in these, in, in the world today, in the, in the Christian world, so much confusion uh, and there's so much um, indifference to what the teachings of God are there and the teachings are very clear, very plain to us. And we have seen, therefore, what this little horn was aspired to do and this afternoon we're going to see that fulfilment. Let me just remind you what we read again this morning, if I may. This little horn grew as high as the host of heaven and it threw down the to the earth some of the host of the stars and trampled on them. Even against the prince of the host it acted arrogantly. It took the regular burnt offering away from him and overthrew the place of his sanctuary. So in other words, it's replaced the, 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 the plan of salvation with another method, as we've been saying. 
Because of wickedness, the host was given over to it together with a regular burnt offering. It cast truth to the ground and it kept prospering in what it did. And the angel went on to tell Daniel, a king of bold countenance shall arise, skilled in intrigue, he shall grow strong in power, shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does, and he shall destroy the powerful and the people of the holy ones. And by his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall be great. But without warning he shall destroy many and shall even rise up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken and not by human hands. That's the, the situation. And God, in summing up here, tells us that it acted arrogantly against Christ and his people. It put to death God's faithful people. It defiled the sanctuary and removed the regular burned offering. And it cast truth to the ground. And uh, just summing up what we saw before, the little horn of Daniel 8 is an apocalyptic symbol of both the pagan and papal Rome that have amalgamated in the teachings together and those things will continue until Jesus comes again. And the chief applications, therefore, are the pagan and the papal sections in that final apostasy and they will continue right through until Jesus returns. But the church compromised biblical teachings with pagan beliefs and traditions. And hence this, this pagan garb, this pagan adornment has found itself covering many of the Christian functions that have turned it foreign to the Bible and more in line with the pagan practice. And of course, I suppose the reason why this happened well, I don't suppose it's, we know why it happened, is because when, when Constantine declared the empire Christian, so remember it was pagan during Constantine, and he, the Christianity was growing, it was a case, if you can't beat them, you join them. And he declared it a pagan empire. So the pagans now were Christians. And instead of being shown the Christian way, they brought their pagan ideas with them and the Christians were led to conform to these ideas. It's, a, it's like today, isn't it? What's expedient to do is the easiest route to follow. And that's what virtually happened in history. Again, <clears throat> we've noted that the spirit of Antichrist was formally witnessed in the typologies of ancient Babylon, but they've been fulfilled by the claims and the actions that we now see through the papacy. And this was the conclusion that the Protestant reformers came to as a result of studying the scriptures. And then we have those lists of things that we put down this morning where these spurious teachings have replaced the true teachings of God. So these are all anti-Christian, instead of Christ teachings. These are teachings instead of his that claim to be the way of salvation. And none of those Prove, uh, provide the way at all because Christ is the only way that we can follow. So just to remind you, the list is there before you again and uh, we're going to take you to Rome and we're going to see some of these things displayed before us. All right, the use of holy water, a christening, sprinkling or pouring instead of baptism. Um, all these things have come into the church and they're all foreign they're not even supported by the Bible in word or form. So, let's go to the city of Rome. Have you got your seatbelts fastened? Because we've got a long journey ahead of us. All right, and I hope there's no drones flying over the airport to stop us landing. But uh, I, I've made a special arrangement for you this afternoon. It's been brought back into service, especially for you. Because we don't have much time, we've got to get to Rome, we've got to whiz around Rome, and then we've got to get back again before the end of the meeting. So I'm going to take you by Concord. All right? Now don't look so worried, sister. Uh, you'll be all right. Just sit back and relax. I know you're going to break the speed of sound, but uh, you'll be okay there. Okay? So we come to Rome, and uh, we've landed. Concord's left us. And here we are outside the Colosseum. 
in the city of Rome. And this, of course, dates back to the pagan empire, the imperial empire of Rome. When I take people to Rome, I usually do two presentations. An imperial visit, going back to the time of the Caesars and everything else, and then a, an ecclesiastical visit like the one we've got here. But uh, this is a typical scene in Rome. It's also a typical scene in Great Yarmouth. We, I noticed last week I was out in the town there and they got the horse and carriages out on the seafront already. Would you believe it? And that was only February then. Now it's beginning of March. But the Colosseum, that famous landmark in Rome, was a magnificent structure. And um, those of you who went, did you go into the Colosseum? Anybody gone into it? No, no. Yes, you've been in it. With your parents? Oh, years ago, okay. We won't say how many years ago, but you went with your parents, okay. But uh, you, you may remember some of it then, okay. But the, 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 the Colosseum, before any of us went there, used to be covered in marble. So if you can imagine the outside all covered in marble, it would be glistening white, and each of those porticos there that you can see, there would be statues maybe statues of emperors and statues of their gods and so on and so forth. Um, it's sometimes referred to as the, as the amphitheatre of Flavius, uh, one of the Caesars there. But this great edifice would be teeming with people. I think it held something like 50,000 spectators, if my memory corrects me right. If I'm wrong, uh, I need to be corrected. But you're looking inside here uh, at the arena... Uh, which comes around the edge here. Uh, you can see that this is underneath what was the ground of the arena. So the arena would have been covered in here. Underneath would have been cells for prisoners, for the, for the people who were going to be thrown to the lions or whatever. And uh, also places to keep the wild animals that came up into the th arena. And the spectators would be lining... Uh, all these terraces here that, of course, a lot of them are in ruins today, but you imagine uh, the, the sort of floors over these with the steps like a football stadium, and you can imagine it uh, there. And I understand that the arena, they could even flood the arena and have naval combats. Uh, it was a magnificent piece of engineering. As we know, the Romans were very, very good at engineering. We owe a lot to, to the Romans for building the roads here in Britain. We've still got some of those roads. So I think they've been resurfaced since. But, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, the Romans were good engineers. Now, just outside the Colosseum, on the opposite side to where we were standing uh, when we were approached it, we've got the Arch of Constantine. Now, I mentioned Constantine again because he was a very prominent figure in the early days when these transitions took place. Uh, Constantine's mother claimed to be a Christian. She was called St. Helena. She's the one who uh, built the um, famous Church of the Nativity in, in Bethlehem. She claimed to be a Christian, and maybe she was a genuine one. I wouldn't like to dispute that. But Constantine himself he was half pagan and half Christian. If you go to Egypt, to the Karnak Temple, you see a statue there of Constantine where he's honouring Ra, the sun god. And here, uh, Constantine finally declared that the empire would be a Christian empire. He made a decree, uh, and, so, and so on. But this is one of his triumphal arches, and it shows in relief, you can see the reliefs up here, uh, of his... his his accomplishments and so on. Uh, that's one of the triumphal arches, and there's a lot of those around. In fact, you can see another arch there, and we'll visit that shortly. It's the Arch of Titus, who might have more interest to us regarding um, the history of the Bible. But this is known as the Roman Forum. It's all in ruins today, as you can see. Uh, some of the edifices there are partly standing, but a lot of it is ruined. The, the Forum was a common meeting place in the ancient Roman world. And people would gather together and, yeah, there'd be, there'd be market stalls where people do shopping and so on. There'd be their temples to their pagan gods and uh, there'd be all sorts of things. But it was also a place where they could gather 
they could meet, they could talk, they could lecture and, you know, all the rest of it. You might even have the equivalent to street preachers, though they probably preaching other things. However, imagine in a place like this, the Apostle Paul may come, or one of the apostles like Peter or someone else, and preach the gospel or try to preach the gospel to the pagans around them, to the heathen. But as you make your way through the forum, you see these ruins of various temples, like the Temple of Vesta and, uh, and so on, and uh, you, you can see all the ruins. Here, here you can see the remains of the shops and things that will be the stalls and things in the little buildings along the side there. And then we come to the Arch of Titus. Now, do you remember who Titus was? He was the Roman general. Because Jesus had made a statement to the Christians. He said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then get out. Do you remember that? And the armies came during the, the War of the Jews in those four years and they besieged the city and no one could get out. And the Christians remembered the words of Jesus, but they couldn't get out. Anyone who did get out would be captured and crucified. But then the army had to withdraw to put down some insurrection up in Galilee. And when that happened, the Christians got out and they escaped. Whereas the non-believers, they remained thinking it was over and eventually Titus came back and he took the city, he destroyed the temple and many of the people were killed. But the ones who remained were taken back to Jerusalem. And I understand they were made to build that Colosseum. It was built in eight years. Now that is some accomplishment. They didn't have the equipment we have today. Eight years to build that, that edifice. If they didn't die in building it, they would have died in the arena. There's no doubt about it. But the Arch of Constantine is very interesting because typical to the triumphal arches, it, it shows some of the things that he did. Now, what do you see on there? This is the relief inside the arch. What can you see there? There's soldiers... And there's Constantine leading, uh, Titus leading his, um, his army. What do you see here? The menorah. the menorah, that's right. The seven-branched candlestick that was taken from the temple in Jerusalem. And this is interesting because it's part of archaeology confirming the biblical record. But, but the seven-branched candlestick taken from Jerusalem. <coughs> now what happened to that candlestick we don't know, but I did read that it was tossed into the Tiber. <coughs> Whether it was or not, I don't know. Maybe it was out of an act of contempt, but it was beaten gold, so I would imagine they might have wanted it for something else. On the far end of the Roman Forum is this building which was the old Senate House. You know, Senate was part of the, part of the government of ancient Rome. Now, those doors there, those are not the original doors. My guide... <laughs> was an official guide that we had, a uh, general conference guide. I was privileged to have the man all to myself that day, but uh, he gave me a lot of this information. Those doors are not the original doors. I'll show you the original doors later. So when I say to you, you remember the Senate House? I'll say those are the doors. But these doors have been uh, the replacement doors, okay? But then near to the Senate House, we have what's known as the Mamertine Prison. The Mamertine prison was a political <coughs> prison for political prisoners. And tradition, and I, I say tradition has it, because apart from what's stated inside here, there is no actual proof that the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul were imprisoned there. There's an awful lot of tradition go, that goes on, and it becomes commercialised, I'll tell you. It's like you go to Israel, it becomes commercialised. All right, you know, there, there, there's the cave where Mary fed the baby Jesus. That belongs to the Orthodox Church. So you pay to go in there and see this cave. Then you go down the same street, Milk Street, and you come to another cave, and that belongs to some other church, and, and uh, that's the cave. And it's all commercialised. So there's no guarantee it's the original. But it's quite feasible because it was a political prison. But inside here is this plaque that's since been put up there, and it lists Peter and Paul as prisoners back there 
in those days of Nero. Uh, however, we go into the prison, and uh, I'm showing you now how the magic is brought in in order to prove, in inverted commas, the stories that are curtailed here. Uh, this plaque on the wall uh, is there's a stone stairway going down to the dungeon. I'll take you there in a moment. And you go down the stairway, and partway down the stairway is this plaque on the wall. And there's a, a dent in the wall behind it. And tradition says that Peter, being the holy man, being the first pope, um, he was being pushed down this, these steps into the dungeon by the soldier who treated him roughly. And as he was pushed, Peter banged his head on the wall and left a dent in the wall. He must have had a thick, pretty thick skull. That's all I can say. But it just shows you the sort of traditional stories that gather to help give some... I, I can't even use the word integrity. To give it some sort of sense of, of magic, you know. It's, it's got to be true or something. And that's how Satan works very often, doesn't he? As we were saying this morning in the Sabbath school class there, uh, that Satan will deceive people by the miracles he performs. Miracles are not necessarily evidence it's from God. The word of God is the safeguard. Things have to line up with the word of God. So many people will be taken in by miracles because they don't know the warnings that God gives them. So that is an example. And we go down into the dungeon down below and there's this altar that's put there today. I'm sure it wasn't there then, of course. But you see the cross... A reverse cross, because again, tradition says, and not all tradition is, is wrong. Some traditions are based on truth, on fact. But the last tradition I've just shown you, it's pretty obvious where that comes from. But Peter, he was crucified, he was a Jew, so he would be put to death by crucifixion. And he said, I'm not worthy to die in the position that Jesus had. So they turned him upside down. So that's quite feasibly what happened. Uh, but Paul, he was a Roman citizen, though he was also a Jew. Because he was a Roman citizen, he wouldn't be crucified. He was beheaded, as you know. But he, this is the dungeon, and you can see some of the instruments there. And uh, there was a door th back there somewhere. And uh, they, they'd often throw the bodies into the, into the sewers beyond. So that's the Mamertine prison. So we come back up into the fresh air again. And here we are on the far end of the Forum. The Colosseum's at the other end. You're looking through another arch. This is the Arch of Septimius Severus, another great uh, leader there. And uh, through that arch, you can see the Arch of Titus. Good position to get a picture, wasn't it? Right outside the Mamertine pr prison. There's the Senate House that I showed you before. All right, let's come back to the other end of the Forum, and you can see the, the, uh, the far side of the Roman Colosseum now that we visited. And if we come down on this side here, just behind the Colosseum, are the, is this Church of St. Clement, which is proved to be uh, a former temple of Mithras. Now, most of the basilicas you see in Rome today were not built as churches, they were built as pagan temples. But they were taken over as churches and modified in some form or another. But this has been discovered to be the remains, or built on the remains, of a Mithra temple. And you go down into the church, and here you see the, uh, some of the things that have been recovered from there. And this little fellow here with a conical cap is the god Mithras. And Mithras was the sun god. And uh, his birthday, guess when his birthday was? December 25. <laughs> All right? Uh, I'll say no more. Uh, and, uh, of course, he's the sun god, and he's slain the sacred bull. Now, they did similar things in Egypt. In the temple of Queen Hatshepsut is the, and these, of course, were pagans, uh, there's this wall painting, I think it is, of uh, the priest administering water from a little bowl and sprinkling it on the baby's head. See, that was, so 
sprinkling goes back to those days. In the Mithra religion, the initiate <coughs> used to stand under a grill and the sacred bull above was slain and the blood would trickle down, that's right, onto the initiate and thus christen him as it were, it wouldn't be called christening, into initiating him or her into the Mithra religion. So you can see where the sprinkling idea originates. All these pagan practices stem back to ancient times, to ancient Babylon or, or some of the places in between. The College of Cardinals, they dress in red, don't they? Did you know that the priests of ancient Babylon used to dress in red and they had a similar sort of means of electing their high priest? And so you can see how these things have their connections through history in these old practices. And Mithra is seen here, there's an altar, the same little conical head there, slaying the bull, there's the bull, slaying the bull. The Mithra temple. And a lot of the things that are practiced in the Christian faith today find their origins or their root through Mithra or Mithraism. Mithraism goes beyond Rome, it goes back to ancient Persia and so on. Now, looking around at some of the so-called holy places of Rome, you can see the, the Church of the Araquili up here, sometimes referred to as the Church of Mary and the Altar of Heaven. But I'm interested here in coming to the Capitoline Hill. And uh, here we are on the top of Capitoline Hill, and uh, you can see the, the, the um, statue here of Marcus Aurelius. Now, Marcus Aurelius was one of the uh, famous men around about, I think I'm correct in saying about 164 BC, around that sort of period of time. Um, he was known for some persecution of the Christians, though some say he was a rather, uh, it was less, uh, not as severe as others. So I'm not going to dispute on that, but he, he was one of the pagan leaders. But there's his statue, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But I want you to notice, what do you see on the ground here in this mosaic? It's like the points of a compass. Do you see that? Because this was the center of Rome. And there's a saying that all roads lead to Rome. So radiating out from the center. And of course, the Roman roads were known for being straight, the straight lines. And uh, uh, this is a very famous place. There's a Capitoline behind, but... If you just come closer, you can see Marcus Aurelius there, and just beneath him here is the papal insignia. So here's the papacy giving its sort of recognition, seal of approval to this pagan ruler. And you can see how Christianity and paganism, again, was influenced together in this way. Behind in the wall of the Capitoline is the statue of Minerva here. We can come a little bit closer to her. The woman in scarlet, <laughs> as I nickname her. Uh, Minerva was the goddess of wisdom. The pagans in Rome, they worshipped many gods and she was the goddess of wisdom. But if you go into the Capitoline Museum here, you see this bull, the she-bull, with two little twins being suckled here um, because you know the story, tradition is that Rome was founded on seven hills. Um, by the way, in Revelation 17, it talks about the seven hills that this woman in scarlet sits on. Now, don't tie it into Minerva there, it's nothing to do with her. But the tradition is that Rome was founded uh, by these two twins, Romulus and Remus. And you can see the name Rome. And they were orphaned or rejected, and they were found and subtled by this she-wolf. So that's the story of how Rome began. And um, I'm not saying that's what happened, but these are the traditional stories that go around. We remember learning those at school. Now, I've taken you here before, <clears throat> and I come back to the head church of Rome, which is the church of St. John in Lateran. And I'm going to take you inside here in a moment, but just to remind you, um, this is, and this is what the plaque actually says, that this is the mother church, Ecclesiarum Mater, the mother church of, of the world. It's the, the sacred church of, of Rome. And 
they, they claim to be the mother church of Christendom throughout the whole world. And the Protestants that broke away are looked upon as the prodigal children. So in the ecumenical movement, they welcome the prodigal children back home, just like the loving father in the parable, you know? But uh, from now on, you do as you're told, sort of thing. So, so this is the church of St. John in Latran. Now, if we go inside, you can see this great basilica here, and this is typical of many of them that you're going to. I'll take you in one or two more, but we're not going to spend our time in all of them. But in the vestibule here, you see the, the statue here of the Emperor Constantine. And then you go inside through the bronze doors. Now, do you remember the doors I mentioned on the Senate? Do you remember the form? These are the original doors. I'm given to understand that were taken from the Senate building and put here on this building. And then we go inside there, and you can see the, the inside of this great basilica here. And there's statues all the way down the side here of important people. And then you've got the altar, the high altar, at the far end there. And uh, if you look up at the ceiling, you see another insignia, which is very common to the papal uh, marks. You can see the, the B with the five uh, marks on here and the, the cross keys and the triple crown of the papacy. You see that? Now, there's a saying that the triple crown contains that expression in Latin, uh, vicarius filiae dei, vicar of the son of God. I checked this up online just this week because there's been a lot said that that's not actually true. But uh, looking online, I see that the triple crown that's used today doesn't have that on it, as far as I could see. But it used to be on former ones. And I took a picture of one of the former ones. Vicar of the Son of God means, you know, the, the personal representative of, of Jesus. Well, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is his personal representative, doesn't it? Jesus said he will come. You know, he will be to, to represent me in my place. Another comforter, as he said. But uh, this is a typical symbol of the papacy. You see the bees and the triple keys, uh, sorry, the cross keys and the triple crown. And you can go through the, into the cloisters here and you notice how the uh, different formation of the columns there along the cloisters. But um, across the road is what is known as the largest relic in the world. This is the famous Sancta Scala, the sacred stairway. Now, tradition says, you notice I'm saying tradition, not the scriptures, tradition teaches that this houses the original staircase, it's not the building, but the staircase inside, that Jesus was led up that staircase in Jerusalem when he was brought to stand before Pilate. But then, before Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, the angels miraculously rescued this staircase. I don't know what was important about it, uh, to rescue it like that, but they miraculously rescued this staircase and they transported it across the heavens to North Africa. But then the Vandals came along, you remember those tribes, and they started damaging everything. And so, to safeguard it, the angels picked it up and they conveyed it to Rome where it stands today. And I believe in Rome it was shifted again to avoid an earthquake. However, that's the traditional story behind it. Not that I believe these things, but I'm just sharing it with you. Now, this is the sacred stairway that they claim is the one that Jesus ascended in Jerusalem when he was brought before Pilate. And uh, this is where the devout, and they are genuine, genuinely devout people. I respect them, you know, for what they are but they're genuinely following what they believe is right, but they've been seriously misled. I'm going to share something with you in a moment. But you see the people here, and they're going up on their knees, climbing the stairs on their knees, going through Hail Marys, so many Hail Marys, or whatever, Patinata, or whatever it is. But they pay the priest, they go up, and if they're even more devout, vow, They'll come down the side stairway and they'll pay the priest again, go up the stairs again, and there's one man, 
And I believe it was this man here. I can't be 100% sure, but I, I think it must have been him because it was soon after this. I was going up the side stairway. So they're going like a merry-go-round, up and down, paying up on your knees, pay again, earning your salvation. This is the famous stairway that Martin Luther, when he was getting sort of hints that things aren't quite right, they decided to send him on a pilgrimage to Rome in order to sort him out, you know, clear his mind. And it was while he was in there, he was going up the, you know, he was going up the Sanctus Scala on his knees, and uh, this text rung high in his mind, the just shall live by faith. He'd read that. He'd been considering this and working it out, and he was disgusted what he saw in Rome, uh, all the corruptions and, and the festivities and the mockery that was going on. And he got part way up on his knees, and this text rang in his mind, and he realized, and he stood up on his feet as the light of truth dawned on his soul, upon his feet, and he shouted, the just shall live by faith. And he ran up the rest of the stairs, much to the astonishment of those around him. But this stairway leads up there to the top, obviously. But this is a slide I bought because I, didn't, I took the other one. But this slide here, it shows the stairway going up in the centre. That's the Sanctus Scala. They've installed it in here. And there's a stairway on either side. So what happens? You pay to go up on your knees. You walk down the stairway and you can go around the thing as many times you feel you need to to get to heaven. And uh, if you're just visiting like I was, you wouldn't do that. I'd rather give my money to the Lord, not to this. And uh, I went up the side stairway here. Now, there was a gentleman who looked very much like that man I showed you there. He came down the stairway and he was staggering like a drunk. He was difficulty going down the stairs, he was staggering away. And I looked at him. I didn't say anything. And when he'd gone past out of earshot, my guide turned to me. He said, you think that man was drunk, don't you? And I said, I didn't say anything. He said, I know you didn't. But you think he was drunk. I said, well, yes, I admit that's what, it, that's what I thought. He says, yes, they all think that. But he's not drunk. He's a very devout man. But he'd been taught that in order to get to heaven, in order to be saved, he has to go up the Sanctus Scala three times a day, every day, for the rest of his life. And he's been doing that now for the last 30 years. And that's what it's done to his legs. My heart went out to that man. Salvation is a gift from Jesus. Nowhere in the Bible do we find instruction to do such things in order to get a heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And to think that this man, so sincere, so devout, was determined to be saved. He thought the only way he could do it was by going up the Sanctus Scala three times every day for the rest of his life on his knees. Isn't that sad? That is how the sanctuary truth that heaven has given us has been defiled. Such false teachings, dear friends. Let's make our way through Rome. This is a famous monument, really. It's to Emmanuel, Victor Emmanuel II, great, uh, I think, a great benefactor to the city. A very beautiful edifice, all in lovely marble and statues. It's, very beautiful. Uh, however, it's one of the landmarks. We come here to what's known as the Statue of Trajan. And this statue um, is surmounted at the top. I'll come down in a moment. But if you look close at the statue, it's, it's got the relief work of all the victories and the, and the achievements and the activities of Trajan, the emperor. But on the top, the church has removed the Statue of Trajan and put a statue of Peter there. Uh, again, it shows how they tried to amalgamate the church with Christianity in order to, to sort of say, look, the church has always been hand in hand with the state. And now the church was ruling the state. Get the idea? 
number of fountains in Rome, and it gets very hot in Rome, so it's lovely to sort of see a fountain, a bit refreshing. This is the fountain of, uh, of a Sedra, and uh, this is the famous People's Square. You can see the Basilica of St. Peter's. We'll go there shortly. And uh, this is the uh, Navona Square, is the Four Rivers Fountain, and then, of course, the Two Toises Fountain that we see here. But one of the most famous or will be the most famous in Rome, is the Trevi Fountain. And you see a lot of artists gathering around here, doing their artwork as well. And uh, it's, it's certainly a delight to see a beautiful fountain, very picturesque, very beautifully put together. And people, you know, they throw coins, make a wish, and throw it into the fountain. You see a lot of that here too, don't you? Uh, but there it is. But we come to the Church of St. Maria in Cosmatin, but just outside that church on the walls is this what's known as the Mouth of Truth. Uh, the, the story goes back to the time if a, if a man thought his wife had been unfaithful, she would have to, he would bring her to the Mouth of Truth, she had to put her hand in there, and uh, she'd be asked, you know, have you been unfaithful? And if she told a lie, it would bite her hand off. Well, we managed to get away with it, all right, but um, you, you can see how these old customs uh, live on, and we get many of those things around. We come to another interesting basilica, that of St. Paul's Without the Walls. And it's a very beautiful edifice, as you can see. This is a statue of St. Paul here. He's got the sword. You can tell with the statue, if it's Peter, he's got the three keys, in, or the two keys in his hand. If it's Paul, he's got the sword, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, symbolised, I presume, what it means in his hand. And St. Paul's Without the Walls, there's Paul statue, this beautiful facade up here, and you can see the Corinthian columns uh, above there. Just a little bit, it's a beautiful mosaic, isn't it? Very, very beautifully done, and uh, there are some lovely things to see there as well. Uh, but we go inside this basilica, <coughs> and this door is main entrance. Again, very beautiful. Uh, I'm afraid the shadow is part way across it, and I couldn't avoid that, uh, sort of getting late in the afternoon when we went here. But this is sort of gilded uh, cross on the door, uh, the ascension of Jesus here, I think it is, or Christ's appearance to Paul. And the relief on the doors showing extracts from the life of Paul. Here you see the Apostle Paul, he's preaching the word of God, and uh, here he's being beheaded for his faith. In the next picture down below you can see where Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus and so on. So they're all released from the life of the Apostle Paul. And we go inside this basilica. Again, it's very similar to the St. John in Lateran that we saw there. And uh, again, the high altar that you see behind. Uh, and, you know, did you know that it's been the custom to put bones under the altar? Sacred bones. Um, there was a time when altars in the churches had bones beneath them. Well, that's a custom in Rome, and it's an ancient custom that goes back, again, to pre-Christian times. We'll come back to that in a little while. But here we see the priest in his confessional. He's looking very pleased with himself. I don't know why, but he, seemed, he didn't seem to mind me taking his picture there. But you see, in the Catholic religion you have to go to confession. And uh, you will go into the side and you'll see them there kneeling before this little grill so they can't see the priest inside and he will listen to all their intimate details concerning the sins that they have committed. And then he will tell them that he will forgive their sins. He'll absolve them from sin. If you go and do such a thing, go and say so many Hail Marys or go and walk with dry peas in your shoes or whatever they tell you to do, I don't know, but you go and perform these penances and then you will be forgiven. That's treating sin very lightly, isn't it? And at the end of the day, only God can forgive sins. And it's not by our works anyway. It's by his grace that we receive through faith. All right? Now, I mentioned baptism earlier, didn't I, or christening. In this church is an ancient baptistry, and it's a very large one. There are a number of rooms around. 
and there are plaques on the wall here with texts on the Bible talking about baptism by immersion. And the steps leading down here into what was the baptistry area. This font wasn't there at the time. The baptistry area would have housed many, many people. Now, people used to be trained in these rooms for about two years before they were received into the church and uh, they would be baptised by immersion. But of course there was a twist to it because there was this idea of original sin, a slightly different idea to what we hold on original sin. And if you did not get baptised, you would be lost. That's why on your deathbed, if you hadn't been baptised, you've got to sprinkle you very quickly, you see, with the, with the holy water. But I did a study on on baptism when I was at college. And uh, I remember it was around the 11th, 12th century that baptism by immersion eventually was withdrawn from the church, simply because it was not convenient. It was more convenient to sprinkle people. It had to be done in Latin, but then if there wasn't time, you can say it in the vernacular, it'll be okay. You know, uh, you, you, you find it just lightens, uh, takes away the seriousness of what it's all about. And so sprinkling is not immersion, sprinkling is dampening. You understand, if you immerse you get soaked, isn't that right? Okay, so, so the, this is what happened. If you go to Pisa in northern Italy, you will see the famous cathedral there, there's also the famous leaning tower, but there is a baptistry, it's a, a rotunda building. And in that baptistry, again, you will see where there was a baptistry area, but today there's a font standing in it with a gate going in. So you can there and you can pour water on, fuse, or you can sprinkle uh, as they so wish. <clears throat> but in, I forget if, I think it was in the cathedral. Um, it was either in the cathedral or the baptistry, I can't remember, it's years ago. Um, there was a picture and in the apse in the ceiling of Jesus and Mary and one of the apostles, can't remember what it was, maybe John or someone, but I was shocked to see that the one with the nail prints in the hands was not Jesus but Mary. I've had people who've seen this picture and I've said, tell me who's got the nail prints in their hands and they look at the picture and I hear gasps, Mary. Now tell your friends, replacing the teachings of Christ, Mary would turn in her grave. I should have put the picture in for you. If I think on, I'll try and bring it show you. <clears throat> we pass through the cloisters here of uh, St. Paul's in the walls, and we come to what's known as the reliquy. Now the reliquy is a place where people come on pilgrimages to venerate these relics. And the relics can be all sorts of things. You know, a piece of soot from the fiery furnace, and uh, a morsel of bread that had been eaten at the Last Supper. Now that, that's one of the claims. Uh, a piece of St. Peter's fishing boat. Uh, some, of the, some of the bones of the apostles here. Uh, some of the nails that nailed Jesus to the cross a piece of the cross of Jesus. You know, if you were to collect all these relics, there'd be more than one cross. <laughs> it, it, you know, it becomes, it does become a laughing stock. But these are the relics, such holy things that have been claimed by Rome to be special, holy things. You go on your pilgrimage and you, you earn your salvation by going on this pilgrimage you get so much credit you'll get into the kingdom and they'll go on these Martin Luther was sent on such a one you know up here you see the host as it's called a piece of the body of Jesus as the bread has been converted by the priest into the body of Jesus and his holy flesh and uh, all these relics are venerated you go there and you see people genuflecting before them and bowing to them and kissing them and stroking them and, and doing all sorts of things it's sad my heart goes out to such people. And talking of relics, we go into the church of St. Peter in the Chains. Uh, 
there San Pietro in Vincioli, it's called. And we go inside this basilica, <clears throat> and here we see a beautiful marble statue of Moses by Michelangelo, and it really is a work of art. I mean, you just look at that, it's magnificent, isn't it? Uh, you know, uh, somebody, I've forgotten who it was, came and looked at it once and they said, why isn't it breathing? Because it looks so lifelike. You can see the veins in the arms and the muscles and, and everything. It's such a beautiful piece of work. I don't know why Moses got two horns on his head, but, <laughs> but, but in Michelangelo's statue of Moses, there's two horns on its head. But it's a magnificent piece of artwork. And Michelangelo was a great artist. <coughs> You know the story of Peter, how he was chained between the soldiers in the prison and the angel came and the chains fell off and the door opened. The angel said, put your shoes on, get your coat and come outside. And he took him out, rescued him from the prison. Well, this is based on that experience. And you can see in this relief work, Peter being released there. He's in prison. The angel comes and wakes him up. The chains fall off. The guards are asleep. He leads him outside into the street. Here we see uh, a picture of the angel. This is uh, one of the famous artists. I, I'm not sure who it was, Rennie, I think it was, who painted this. There's the guard fast asleep and the angel waking Peter up here. <coughs> and then we see um, Cardinal uh, Cusano here venerating the Apostle Peter. Uh, so this, this now becomes idolatry, isn't it? And uh, you can look up to the ceiling and you see this, what looks like a beautiful painting. And, if you go in the Vatican Museum, you'll see lots of pictures like this, lots of them. But you notice what's happening. Here is God blessing the papacy, the church. There's the Pope with his triple crown, leaning forward and this Protestant or whoever it is, is cowering away from him. And down here, they're putting the Protestants down you know, with a sword, or with a feet or whatever. Typical pictures of the attitude towards the Protestant faith. Now, in the main part of the main body of the church, you look down to the altar here, and beneath the altar, you go down the steps on the side here into this crypt, and you see right beneath the altar this golden casket, the glass case there, with these chains inside. Now, tradition has it that these are the very chains that bound Peter to the soldiers in the prison in Jerusalem that day. And just to prove it, when they put those chains in that casket, they came back in the morning. Overnight they had miraculously twisted themselves together. And so I stood there and with sadness I watched the devout believers coming in and venerating these chains. They were items to be worshipped, to be adored, because these were the chains that bound Peter. There's no, nothing to prove they were, but the magic comes in, you see. Just to prove it, they twisted miraculously together overnight. <clears throat> Let's come to Veneto Street famous street in Rome and on the street corner we see the symbol of the papacy again. <clears throat> you notice the terminology Pontifex Maximus we've come across before <coughs> excuse me which was the title of the Caesars. It means the chief bridge builder. They had their pontiffs in those days and in the papal times, when they took over rulership in the West, he steps, the, the Pope steps into the seat of Caesar, taking on his name the pontiff and the title of the Caesars, Pontifex Maximus. That title, <coughs> excuse me, that title really, again, is a, a blasphemous title because Christ is the chief bridge builder. He's the one who links us back to the Father. He came to reconcile us, didn't he? To bring us back. No one come to the Father but by me. And we come to the church of the Cappuccini Fathers. Very interesting church. And you'll be surprised by what you see. You go in here and there's lots of interesting things to see inside. There's paintings and, 
and various things. One of St. Michael killing the dragon, or Satan in this case, um, painting by Rennie. And uh, here we see Francesco, St. Francis, venerating this skull of one of the saints. And um, here we see the mummified remains in a golden case glass coffin of Father Vertino um, Roberto, who is enshrined there, again an object of veneration. I've stood there and see the saints worshipping these things. And then we make our way to this interesting place. Back to this church, from a distance it looks very beautiful, doesn't it? Lovely decorations. Uh, artistic work, yes? Quite attractive from a distance. And, uh, but these are actually human bones. And uh, there's one particular bone, which is one of these here, that is polished. Because you see the saints coming in and they kiss the stone, smooth it with their hands, and it got polished in this veneration. And this is a monumental cemetery, the Holy Bones of Rome. Now, you look at this very closely, you think from a distance it does look quite ornate, but when you get close up and begin to see what it is, these are the skeletons of former monks from the Cappuccini Friars. What happens, these are, each little section is a little cemetery, an indoor cemetery. The soil that you see here is said to be special holy soil that's been brought back from Jerusalem and it's placed there. And when the, when the monk dies, he's buried in this soil. When he decomposes, he's dug up to make room for the next one and his body is either dressed in his habit, hung up there, or the bones are separated and they're secured to the wall and the ceiling in this sort of pattern. And the saints come and they adore these things. They worship them, they venerate them, because these are the holy bones of Rome. And you know, you can go to Mount Sinai, to the foot of Mount Sinai, to the monastery there, St. Catherine's Monastery. I've been there, I've seen it. I've taken the pictures. They've got a reliquary there, a separate building, and it's full of bones, human bones. In South America, when I was there last year, I went into... Uh, uh, one of the cathedrals there, and down in the crypts is a, a cemetery. Uh, they haven't done this with them, but there's a section there where they've got the bones all laid out in a pattern, all separated and laid out in pattern. It's quite gruesome, isn't it, when you think of it? And uh, there it is, the bones of Rome, the holy bones. And he looks an interesting character up there, doesn't he? Let's just come in a little bit closer. The grim reaper of death. There he is. Well... If, if you want to go and join them when you snuff it, then you're welcome to go. <laughs> but uh, but, but that's, that's what happens uh, in this order, the Cappuccini Friars, the bones of Rome, things to venerate, things to worship, things to do on your pilgrimage, a way of to get to heaven. I mentioned to you that uh, a lot of the churches of Rome, the basilicas today, were former pagan temples. We come here to the famous Pantheon of Rome. And in front of it is a stela from Egypt. And can you see up there the cross at the top? But beneath the cross is a model of the sun with the various rays of the sun. In fact, if we come closer, you can perhaps see that. Can you see the sun there? I must apologise for the blotchiness of these slides. When I took these slides, it was on 35 millimeter film. But then, having used them in and out of projectors, they tend to get scratched and that. And then I, I sort of um, scanned them and put them on computer, but a lot of them come out with blotches, so I've got to try and clean them up. They can take hours to do that. But you notice the basilica behind, it's got the name of Herod Agrippa there, Agrippa on the Basilica. Now this pantheon was a, a pagan temple to the many gods, pantheon referring to many, many gods that they worshipped. And the chief god was the sun god, as it was in most of the pagan religions. 
and all the way around would have been uh, their gods in these porticos that they worshipped. Uh, this has sort of been made into a little um, altar there today, but it was, as I say, a pagan temple. Now, in the ceiling, you see in a moment, was a hole. Now I've got a glass window on it, but uh, right beneath it, in the centre of the Pantheon, was a big altar. And it's not there today, I'll show you where it is shortly. But that altar was where they offered the sacrifice to the sun god. And when the shaft of light from the sun came down through that hole and hit the altar, then the sacrifice was made to the sun god. And uh, there you can see the, the hole up there in the ceiling where, this, uh, where the sun would come through, the pantheon to the many gods. All right, bear in mind the altar. <clears throat> Look here on the River Tiber, and uh, quite an interesting river. You can travel up and down that river, and we come to what's known as the Castle of the Angel, which is quite near the Vatican. Uh, but these beautiful sculptures of the angel, very beautiful to look at. The story is that a plague hit Rome, and the Pope, he prayed about it, and he saw in vision an angel uh, there standing over the city, and it stopped the plague. And so these angels have been carved here, beautiful artwork, uh, so it's called the Castle of the Angel. But inside that castle were torture chambers and secret corridors going right up to St. Peter's Basilica, which is down the road. So we're standing here now in St. Peter's Square in what's known as Vatican City, 108, 108 acres of the Vatican State. And they're looking down from the cathedral, down this street here, and you can see uh, right at the end there, there's the castle of the angel. You see the rotunda castle and the bridge there. And um, the monument to Victor Emmanuel is over here. And uh, it's difficult to identify anything else there. But uh, looking down that street, there's the stela. Again, an Egyptian stela. In Heliopolis, there were many stelias, the city of the sun, because the stela pointed up to the sun. But this street here is very interesting. You've heard in Revelation where it talks about the deadly wound. It says the deadly wound was healed. That street is called Reconciliation Street. And you look on the plaque, and it's got the year 1910, conciliatory, um, whatever they call it, <laughs> in, 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 in the Italian. Uh, but uh, but it's, it's, a, it's named to commemorate the time when the... Uh, when the Lateran Pact was signed between Cardinal Gaspari and Benito Mussolini, thus healing that deadly wound and restoring some element of a state back to the Vatican. But instead of the Holy Roman Empire that dominated Europe, there's now just 108 acres, okay? But that, that's Reconciliation Street going all the way down there. Okay, um, these beautiful fountains, beautiful... The, the columns were designed by Benini, and uh, beautifully done. There's two rows of columns, one behind the other, as you can see here. But a lot of this stuff uh, was taken from the Roman Forum uh, that's now in ruins, as you see, to design this. And St. Peter's, Peter's Basilica was built on indulgences. Tetzel came around selling his indulgences in the days of Martin Luther, around about 1517, and uh, he was saying, you know, uh, you can help your soul out of purgatory. The Pope has given a very special dispensation. Pay some money and get an indulgence and it'll get them out quicker. And these poor people living in darkness, not knowing what the scriptures taught, believed this and there were poor people giving their money. And he had the famous phrase, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the, coin, uh, the soul out of purgatory springs. And so the, the money was gained to build this great basilica for St. Peter. Uh, but it's a beautifully designed arena there. In fact, if you line it up properly, uh, which I failed to do, you can only see one column uh, because they lined up. They're so organized there. Well, that was my guide, by the way, Romeo Capiz. He was Romanian. And uh, he was the official GC guide at that time. And so we're looking out on St. Peter's Square here in the Vatican. There's the stela, surmounted by the orb of the sun and then the cross. 
and we go inside there, you can see it clearer. There's a statue of St. Peter with his keys in his hand and the statue of Paul with his sword and the word of God. And then we see, I've shown you this before, I apologise for the quality of the slide, there's the papal triple crown with the cross keys and the title Pontifex Maximus and uh, Charlemagne in the alcove there and this is the so-called holy door. That's another means of salvation. Um, the holy door is opened only once every, about every 25 years. It's when the Pope makes a special decree of a special year, like an amnesty, I suppose, and that between certain times of the day, if you then go through that door, because it's only opened on that particular day, uh, if you go through that door, you'll gain absolution from all your sins that you're going to commit and that you have committed. And, you know, absolution from any penalty of sin. In other words, do what you like now. That's basically, I know they wouldn't say that, but that's basically what it implies. So that's an easy way to get saved, isn't it? If you can just catch the right year out and go along to Rome and then you go through the holy door, you can get absolution for your sins. That, that's the teaching. That's another, another picture of the same door, but uh, uh, alteration. There's several pictures you can get of that as well. And then you go inside the cathedral and people are actually taken in by the glitter, and that is the thing today, isn't it? The more glitter, the more adornment, it looks so holy, and it's, it's, it's really, this is what the church is all around. Uh, and... Um, you know, you, you've got the, the font there by Bernini. It's the, it's the holy water font, salt and water with a little incantation over it. You've got the famous Pieta by Man Michelangelo. Today that's behind a perfect screen because you remember a number of years ago it was vandalised. And it's a beautiful piece of art. They're very moving to look at. Jesus taken down from the cross in the arms of his mother Mary. And... Um, is a very touching piece of art, just as you go into the basilica. A number of altars on the way down, the altar of St. Jerome, and they've all got different names, the lease on the wall of the popes and so on. Uh, again, the insignia with the bees and the cross keys and the triple crown. And of course, you've seen the statue of Jupiter. Uh, they say it's St. Peter, the first pope, but archaeology has proved scientifically that is the statue of Jupiter. And I stood there, I took this photograph, you're watching the saints caress the feet and venerate it and stroke it and kiss it and all the rest of it. And above it is the, uh, is the dove with the, of peace with the sun rays behind it. The sun very much in this temple. Um, the altar that was in the Pantheon is now in St. Peter's Basilica, the high altar. This bronze altar, oops, here. This bronze altar here. Let me just go back there. And it's been surmounted by the cross. You can see at the top of the orb there. But this was the altar with its bronze pillars and so on. But beneath the altar, down there, can you see that from where you're sitting where I'm dazzling the light? There's a crypt, again, for the holy bones. Because in there, it's said to be the tomb of St. Peter. Now, how it came about that the pagan Romans crucified Peter, and with the crucified victims, we know that they didn't treat their remains with respect, and they discarded them. How on earth that body was preserved and kept until the church took over and built St. Peter's in order to incarcerate them there. It's a wonder, isn't it? It's claimed that those are the bones of St. Peter, and there's his coffin to prove it, and uh, that's what they claim, is the bones of St. Peter. And people can go down there, and they can venerate the tomb of St. Peter. These are all holy things to do. And behind we see what's known as the high, this is the high pulpit. And you can see a beautiful artwork, but what do you see here? The rays of the sun. You see, it faces the sun, uh, just like the pagan temples did. And you've got the, you've got the 
pulpit here with the triple crown posed on top and the little cherubs all around and the rays of the sun radiating through there. And then around the atrium, you've got various statues. This is St. Veronica, who's said to have wiped Jesus' brow as he was going to Calvary. And, uh, and St. Benedetto, uh, one of the popes. And St. Helena, that's um, the mother of Constantine, and so on. But you can go up into what's known as the Whispering Gallery. Now, Michelangelo painted the ceiling. How he managed it, I don't know, but they say he lay on a pile of mattresses. Seemed a little bit rickety to me, but that's what they say. But it's very high up there, and you can actually go up there. I've been up, and you go up through the side, uh, from the inside, you go up, and it's like a spiral circus that comes around, and you can walk around here on the Whispering Gallery, and then you can go up a staircase on the inside of that dome, higher and higher and higher, up to that level. Now I'm going to take you up there, because from the top you have this, well, it's not quite the top, this is the statuary, and you can see the great size of these statues on the top here of the basilica. But you know you can go even higher, as I said, that's the dome we're looking into, up to this level here. And you climb around, sort of spirals around the edge on the inside, right up to the top. And that's where we go here. And we're looking right down to the statuary now, where we've just been, right down Reconciliation Street. And you can see the Castle of the Angel, uh, Victor Emmanuel's monument, and quite a number, quite a, a sight of the city all around, isn't it? Magnificent scene. And you can look down and see the city of Rome uh, that we have visited. These are the Vatican Gardens part of the estate of the Roman, uh, of the Vatican State today. And uh, the Pontifical Gregorian Academy is there too. That's where, um, bless his heart, uh, what was he called again? Um, thank you. Dr. Samuel Bacchiocchi, uh, Italian. Oh, if you've ever heard him talk, he's so excitable, really, really Italian, you know. He was, he was, tells his story uh, when he was a boy and uh, somebody had lent him a New Testament and he was sitting in the apartment at home reading a New Testament. The priest came in and, and he, he said, what you're reading is a New Testament. He pulled it out of his hand. You're not supposed to have that. And he took it off him. He said, give it back to me. He said, that doesn't belong to me. It belongs to someone else. Well, the priest confiscated it. Anyway, Bacchiocchi eventually became a Seventh-day Adventist and uh, a professor in one of our universities. But, you know, he had nerves of steel. My wife knew him. He was at college when she was there. He was one who could sell pork to a Jew. He, he just had the gift of the gab. But Sam did something very courageous. He went back to Rome. He went to the Papal Gregorian Academy and he did his PhD. You know what he did it on? The change of the Sabbath. He was so brazen-faced to Rome, and he, he did his PhD, his degree, on the change of the Sabbath, from Sabbath to Sunday. You can buy his thesis. It's a book. You can get it from the Stanford Press. You, you can buy it. And he did this. And, you know, he had... He, you, you know, they, they give you a, a... What do you call it now? Where you have to meet the panel before you finally qualify and it was on a Friday afternoon. And uh, he said they were very kind the way they addressed him, they respected him, but he used to have nightmares sometimes because of what was happening. Uh, and uh, he said they were very kind to me. But the interesting thing is Sam testified for his faith about the Sabbath at that meeting. And uh, the cardinal who was conducting, he eventually stood up and his, he looked at his watch Friday evening, he said, well, now, he says, I think we'll bring this to a close. We thank Sam for his presentation that he's done. And it's coming up now to the beginning of the Holy Sabbath day. Isn't that remarkable? Sam got his thesis on what he called the Pope's skin, real skin. Don't know, the Pope's skin, but that's what he called it. And he got a medal. And the first and I think only Protestant ever to do what he did. But uh, 
he was a witness. Some now rests awaiting for his Lord to call him back. But here we're looking out on the Vatican Gardens, very beautifully done. Some of those pictures I actually took, not just from the roof, but from the window of the Vatican Museum. But uh, I'm going to take you in there just for a moment now because we're going to close. But we're looking here on the papal apartments, and here's the window where the Pope, that was Pope Pius, wasn't it, who was there uh, at the time, and uh, appears to the crowds and pronounces his blessing upon them. But he has to be looked after by a guard called the Swiss Guard. And they have their uniforms, very proud of their uniforms, no doubt. But, uh, you know, I often think of this. If Jesus were around, did he have guards like that to look after him? He had angels, didn't he? Yes. He needs the Swiss Guard, men with spears and what have you. But uh, let's just come around the corner from St. Peter's Basilica. And we're going to the Vatican Museum. And there's lots to see in there, but that's for another time. But there's one thing I want to close with, and that's the famous ceiling by Michelangelo. Now, I get it wrong, you know. I said he lay on a pile of mattresses for the for the Whispering Gallery, I, I should have, that, that wasn't correct, I correct it. It was the Sistine Chapel, makes more sense, still wobbly. But this is the famous ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And uh, this chapel is where the cardinals go into conclave. The doors are locked and they don't come out again until they have chosen the next pope. And you know when they've made it because white smoke is sent up this special chimney. Okay, but the Sistine Chapel is an interesting place because when you look at the detail on the ceiling, the, I didn't take these pictures, obviously. They bought, this is a fisheye lens probably or something, but it's not very good quality. But the detail of that ceiling is so, so finite, really, in its detail. The creation... And uh, that's God creating the, the earth, the sun, the moon, and so on. And then Adam uh, being created, the creation of Adam. And, and then the last judgment. And uh, I end with that picture because uh, in our studies of Daniel, it climaxes virtually with the judgment that we're going to look at next Sabbath morning. But it's through that judgment that God will reconcile all things. In his sanctuary, he will put things right, as it were. But also, it says judgment begins at the house of God. Church, therefore, is the house of God. And that's when the little horn, the papacy, will come to its end. And Christ will come claiming his kingdom. So may God help us to be ready, is my prayer. Thank you so much.